Hello and welcome to Covenant Bible Fellowship tonight as we tackle a study in Matthew once again. We're going to be looking at uh, the next section here of Matthew chapter 16. Uh, last week we looked at Matthew chapter uh, 16 verses uh, 1 through 18 and uh, we are going to be picking up here at verse 19 and on. Uh, so Please, uh, if you don't have your Bible open already, go ahead and flip it open uh, to that section of Scripture. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for giving us this chance to be here, uh, to have our, uh, our minds opened by your word. And you said that uh, your word does not go forth and return to you void, but it accomplishes all that you please. So. Lord, we pray that it would accomplish all that you please us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, now as you guys know, I've been looking at a few different versions of Scripture uh, each time that I do this. T tonight, we're going to be using uh, the Message, which is a translation that uh, is not as popular as some of the others that I've been using, but uh, has more of a, of a modern English take. Uh, and we are also going to be looking at something called the Phillips translation. Uh, and finally, uh, we are going to be referencing the King James as well. Uh, the King James is still an extremely popular translation of Scripture, and it has been for quite some time. Um, I, as many of you know, do not believe that the King James is perfect. Uh, I know that there are those who do. Uh, I believe that the King James, like any other translation, uh, is going to have its own slants, its own issues. Uh, and so while it is reliable and useful, um, one of the biggest issues that people have with it today, and I've said this before, but uh, is the fact that it is not in modern English. Um, we have a living language in English, and uh, anyone that doesn't believe that can uh, read Beowulf and uh, tell me what they think. So um, as time goes on, uh, new words, new terms are uh, brought into usage, and, and old ones are kind of phased out. Uh, and so it becomes a little bit more difficult for each new successive generation to understand what was written hundreds of years ago. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's still not useful. There's a lot of clarity that comes from looking at the King James Version, um, even if it is poetic in nature. So. Um, we're going to be using that as a reference guide, but let's go ahead and pick up with the message to begin with here in verse 19. Uh, and I, I want to, before we before we start with that, just refresh everyone's minds uh, on what we were looking at previously to this. Um, we've had kind of a, um, a bout between Christ and the combined forces of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, and that has produced this uh, stalemate, if you will, from the, uh, the public's eye, uh, but in reality, quite the victory for Christ, um, which is that he, he was able to give them a response, and the response that he gave them was uh, that, you know, Christ was not really concerned about, um, uh, about bread, uh, he was concerned about the the falsehoods being taught by the Pharisees and the Sadducees in that uh, you could supposedly either be your own salvation or that you could uh, rely upon an absolute obedience to the law and to legalism, uh, both of which end up saying the same thing, which is you know that in some way you are responsible for your own salvation. And so that's kind of rejected by Christ here, and, and he, he puts it to them in the, their, their own faces um, when he reminds them back at the very beginning of the chapter that he says, um, you know, you know how to tell the, the seasons, you know how to tell the sky and the weather by the sky, but uh, you, you don't even understand the signs of the times. Um, you know, basically, you don't know what you're talking about. So um, he gets to the end of this section. Uh, and he, he kind of transitions now into uh, speaking about who is he, right? And we talked about this last time uh, that we got together. 
who, uh, who is Christ? That's the, the, the point of this section is who, who is Christ? Um, Christ is the foundation of the church. Christ is the anointed one of God. Uh, Christ is, in fact, God himself. Um, and so he, he kind of points back to uh, himself in the, the section verses 17 and 18. He's pointing back to himself. Uh, and many believe that he was pointing to Peter as an example of the faith that builds the church. Uh, but in verse 19, we're going to be picking up with uh, a little bit more uh, of the action steps uh, that come into this. And I have a couple of folks here uh, with me. Um, so hopefully I can get a little bit of commentary going tonight. Uh, but we're going to be picking up with um, verses 19 and, and 20. In the, the message, it reads, and that's not all. So I want to kind of bump back and read the, the previous few verses that we already covered, um, which starts at verse 17. Jesus came back. God bless you, Simon, son of Jonah. You didn't get that answer out of books or from teachers. My father in heaven, God himself, let you in on this secret of who I really am. And now I'm going to tell you who you are, who you really are. You are Peter, a rock. This is the rock on which I will put together my church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. Now, that's, this is one of the reasons why I, I encourage you to read through multiple translations. You remember last time I was kind of talking about the whole, the gates of hell can't stand against the church thing, uh, and how what it really means is that the gates are gates. You know, they're not going to be able to hold us back. Um, so it's a little bit more clear when you read multiple translations, and in this one it comes out with that. Um, so he says that uh, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. And then verse 19, and that's not all. You will have complete and free access to God's kingdom, keys to open any and every door, no more barriers between heaven and earth, earth and heaven. A yes on earth is yes in heaven, a no on earth is no in heaven. And then it says, he swore the disciples to secrecy. He made them promise that they would tell no one that he was the Messiah. Okay, so this is kind of an interesting but often twisted section of scripture. Um, in the King James Version, uh, it says, you know, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So it's a slightly different connotation uh, in the King James than what we see, you know, with a yes and a no. Um, this is a little bit more direct. We're talking about binding and loosing. Uh, and then just to give you a kind of a third uh, party understanding, if you will, we'll go to the Phillips translation, um, which is another one that I recommend for more of an easy reading of the, the on scriptures. It says um, here, uh, he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whatever you forbid on earth will be what is forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be what is permitted in heaven. Uh, and so it's a little bit closer to the, the real understanding of that scripture than just simply saying yes and no. Um, so that's, again, why I would caution you to, again, read more than one translation. If you just read the message, it'd be more understandable in some areas, but it would, in other areas, kind of twist the, uh, the intent. Um, so we want to we wanna have more of an expansive look at that. Um, but the question that I have uh, for everyone that's following online, um, but uh, also those who are, are here in person, uh, is um, what does this section mean? You know, it says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you forbid on earth will be what is forbidden in heaven. Or in the King James language, uh, whatever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What does that exactly mean? What does that mean? Uh, what does that mean? Because I can tell you, I've, I've had um, I've had some interesting discussions with those of other faiths, uh, and there's a very similar belief uh, in the Mormon Church. Um, in fact, the church is said to bind together those in marriage, uh, and that that is bound on the authority of the church, not of God. And so, unlike what we believe that that a marriage covenant is something that's sacred because of God, uh, in the Mormon Church, 
you are considered to be sacredly bound because that sacred anointing is given to the church. And since the church binds you here on earth, you will be bound in heaven. And so one man can be married to seven women and that's just fine because you won't get married in heaven, but uh, you'll already be married. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what is this, what does this really mean? Nobody? So, no peeps? Um, to be bound on earth versus bound in heaven? Yes. I think, for me, things that are, if you're asking in the will of God, it just reinforces it. But it is, I'm not super clear on it, but you can't, he's not going to, he says he's not going to answer prayers that are asked amiss because you're going to spend it on yourself. Right. So it's got to be something that fits in with his character, his justice, his glory, and his mercy. Those things together. Sure. Okay. So basically something that's already in God's will? Yeah. Okay. I think it refers to after one has arrived, that is to say, there's no big change between heaven and earth that you are adopted in one of the family you're already there you might as well be Enoch hmm okay and what 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 you do while you're here so you're talking about binding and loosing yourself basically I, I'm talking about yeah maybe you will be so tied in with the father with the son one of many a brother, an adopted son, you're already there. You're already of one mind. Okay. So does this extend to something like what the Catholic Church believed uh, in excommunication? What, being kicked out? Right. If, well, for instance, let's say... kicked out or being disfellowshipped until you straight up a fly right. Well, understandable, right? That's, that's explained in other places in the New Testament, but there's a strong-held belief in the Catholic Church that if one is excommunicated, they're not simply disfellowshipped, they're disfellowshipped from heaven, which is to say right. being bound here on earth binds the person from heaven. Hmm... I mean, it's an authority that's clearly being granted by Jesus, who has the authority to grant it, right? I mean, if God, if, if God has the authority to do something, which obviously he does, he's God, then he could do whatever he wanted. He could give one person the right to kill without it being a sin if he wanted to. It's not in his character, but he could. So um, knowing that that's the case, uh, and he is clearly granting an authority, then the big question becomes, what authority does he grant here? What exactly are the boundaries of this binding and loosing authority that he's granting. Because if, if he does grant the ability for men to decide who goes to heaven and who goes to hell, then clearly that's a violation of his own um, right to, to govern, his own right of, of decision. You know, because it, at the White Throne Judgment, it does not say that God's going to... to um, make a judgment call based on what the, the church said. No, it's based on what God said. Right, it's based on the law. Um, each, each person rises and falls on their own merits. Um, so knowing that that's the case, it also says that he looks to see if their name is in the book of life. Um, so is this something that affects whether or not your name is in the book of life? Well, it does say you can be blotted out of the book of life, which means at one time you were written in it. Right. Now, as I understand it from reading through Scripture, and I could be wrong, but as I understand it from reading through Scripture, it's God's hand that both writes in and blots out from the Book of Life. Right. Not the authority granted to the church. Correct. And as I understand it, no authority granted to the church allows us to force God's hand to move. No. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to read into this that, but let's take this a different, let's take, take this a different tack. Let's, um... Uh, the way that this is usually misused beyond things like what I've been mentioning here um, with a lot of the, the cults, um, one of the, the biggest misuses of this is the same as what we've previously looked at um, with the whole name it and claim it sort of movement, 
um, which I, I run into on a regular basis still right. um, with people saying, you know, I bind this. Um, but at the same time, can we really call that a misuse? Because well, if, what's the context? Well, I mean, like, for instance, you know, I feel a cold is coming on. Hey, you don't look too good. Are you sick? Oh, no, I reject that. Uh, I'm going to bind that in the name of Jesus. I mean, is that a misuse or is that an appropriate use of authority that's been granted? Well, what's the context of binding and loosing? I'm not sure it's binding and loosing is in the context of killing off the virus. <laughs> right. So let's go ahead and take a little bit of a deeper look at this. We've got some really good questions. So I think we'll be able to, to pick out some good answers. Um, so a little bit of backstory. Uh, binding and loosing is a phraseology that you see come through, translated a little bit clearer in the King James. Uh, but those, because the other ones kind of try to um, transform it into a more understandable language, but they're doing it without taking the in original intent. So the original intent of those words is literally to bind as in to tie something up and to loose as in to untie something. Uh, and, and the reason why those words were used is because it was a common Jewish phrase at the time. Right. Um, so it's actually coming from uh, the Jewish legal speak, uh, pharisaical language, if you will. So are we talking about something similar to the eye of the needle referring to that small gate in the wall that camels were forced to go through on their knees without their stop? It was similar in that they were both Jewish expressions, yes. So this okay. is going to be a Jewish legal phraseology. And what it's referencing is to uh, declare something to be uh, forbidden or to declare something to be allowed. So um, legally speaking, if something is bound, it would be like saying there's a cease and desist order. Um, or it, to, to say something is loosed uh, would be to say that someone has uh, a license to do something. So knowing that, does that shed any light? Yeah, well, that puts it more in context because you can't exactly tell a virus it's illegal to make it sick. <laughs> right. Okay, so um, this is talking about authority. Uh, and this is authority through action, which means this is going to apply um, to those who are using free will, if you will. This is going to apply to people making decisions, making choices. Um, but that brings us back to our first question about is it appropriate to say that this is something where the church as a whole gets to decide whether or not something is a sin? Hmm. You know, so this is a, that's a really good question. Um, let, me, let me go ahead and quote from one of my favorite uh, sources. Now, I do have to warn you, uh, as a source, although it's useful, um, I don't agree with everything, obviously, uh, that these folks have, but there's a, a group online that answers a ton of biblical questions. It's called gotquestions.org. Uh, and if you Google just about anything referencing the Bible, they generally come up on the first page. So they're pretty easy to find. Right. Um, but they, they do come from a strictly Calvinist background, as I understand it. Uh, and so there are some things where I might differ in uh, theology. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they do have some good answers here. This is what they say on the question of binding and loosing. The concept of binding and loosing is taught in the Bible, uh, where it quotes that verse. In the verse, Jesus is speaking directly to the apostle Peter and indirectly to the other apostles. Jesus's words meant that Peter would have the right to enter the kingdom himself, uh, that he would have general authority symbolized by possession of keys, and that preaching the gospel would be the means of opening the kingdom of heaven to all believers and then shutting it against the unbelievers. So this is uh, according to got questions, and I, I happen to agree with them. Uh, the binding and loosing phraseology used is one that is applying because the whole of scripture talks about, um, you know, to him who knows to do right and does it not to him, it is a, it is a sin, wow. right? Uh, and so binding and loosing is applying to the fact that you have been given a grant of authority uh, by nature of being the first person to profess belief in me as Christ, as God, as the Son of God. And so having uh, professed this authority, Peter, 
you are now uh, the first pebble in a foundation that's being built, essentially, um, which, which means that you are opening the keys, if you will, you're opening this kingdom, this foundation, this building to everyone else, and now they're put to a decision. Then they have to choose, are they going to be bound or are they going to be loosed? You have the authority to put them to this decision. You don't have the authority to, to choose the decision for them. So basically, since you're preaching the gospel, you're opening the kingdom of heaven, you're loosing things here on earth and in heaven uh, to all believers, uh, and then those who are unbelievers, you are condemning them by nature of preaching righteousness. Yeah. Just like in elsewhere in scripture where it says that Noah uh, condemned the world by his righteous acts, right? It, Noah wasn't out there going, you're going to hell, right? Right. It, what he was doing is, repent! <laughs> repent do do as god says because he's going to destroy the world um and, and and we need to to straighten up fly right and so by nature of having given the truth and demonstrating righteousness himself he was the picture he was the foil against which everyone else could be measured and thus condemned and so peter is here the foil uh, of one who he is he is the example of one who having been given the chance was exposed to the truth and chose to cling to the truth to be the first one to say you are the christ the son of the living god does that make sense sort of <laughs> All right, so um, we'll read through this section one more time. We're going to read through this section in the uh, King James Version this time. Uh, and we'll get to the end, and we'll see if that kind of clicks a little bit. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he the disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. And then he moves forward. Um, but we're going we're gonna to stop there at the end of verse 21. The reason that I include verse 21 in that is because I believe that the reason for Christ telling his disciples that they should not tell anyone he was Christ is important. That's always been something that kind of stood out to me before I understood this section. Um, why would he forbid them from telling people who he was. Why is that important? Why, yeah. why does that matter? And the reason why that matters is because he had not yet completed the work. So preaching Christ, preaching himself as being the son of the living God, um, would be a bad thing at that moment because it would, get a, it would be far more likely for people to say, nah, I don't believe you, bye, right? Which binds them which right now they're not bound. Their decision has not been made. Um, but as soon as he is done suffering, enduring, enduring and being killed and raising to life, then they'd be able to preach. They'd be given an anointing to preach even. And Christ would be able to open the eyes of everyone else, just like he opened the eyes of Peter. So there's this, this sort of understood, um, moment where Christ says, all right, now that you guys know, that's great, but don't go telling anybody yet. Here's why. And then he goes forward and I'll read it in the Phillips. From that time on where Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he would have to go to Jerusalem and endure much suffering from the elders, chief priests and scribes, finally be killed and be raised again in the life on the third day, etc. So then are we somewhat talking about, because I had looked this up and I had a thing where it says, no, it doesn't have to do it had to do with being uh, under, Plagueis Josephus, the Jewish historian, writes that under the Queen Alexander of Jerusalem, the Pharisees had become the administrators of all public affairs, empowered to banish and readmit whom they please, as well as to loose and bind. And it had to do with legal considerations for that particular instance. Um, so if we're talking about something where Paul said, in the Corinthian church, which had taken in so many heathen women, don't let those women teach. 
He wasn't talking about all the women, but in this instance, this is a cultural definition we're making. Is that is that a possibility? Um, you know, I haven't researched that, so I don't know. But if it if, but, it, if it deals more with the situation that is, and you have some authority to make some rules for this group, right? Binding and loosing, which is what you're saying, and which is what Josephus was saying. It doesn't have to do with you know attacking viruses or the enemy. It has to. Do no, with it has to do with setting social norms right. in a new, growing uh, a, a church, which up to this point has not been called the church, right? I mean, right. It's, these are just the disciples of Christ. So he's preparing them for this new world, this new thing that's going to happen, which would come to be known as the way. And then as Christians, right. Um, which was a, a strange sort of, you know, we got to set some parameters here for this group here. Right. It was, it was going to be something that would kind of come out of the blue at them when all of a sudden they would go from just being, you know, the disciples waiting in the upper room, to 5,000 new people just join the church. Right. Now what do we do? Right. How do, how do we set this up so that they end up being able to work together as a group? Right. So there's a, um, the, the, there is another half to this statement that I'm going to bring out here in a second. Okay. Um, but but that, is, that is correct. So then we move on from this part, and Peter kind of <laughs> takes the exact opposite route. Uh, and doesn't understand why Jesus is talking about the necessity of his death. Um, so I, it makes me feel like he perhaps didn't understand why Jesus didn't want him to tell anyone that he was Christ either. Because they weren't ready that, to figure right, it This out. is something that hadn't been explained to them by God, if you will. Okay. This hadn't been opened to them yet. And so Peter says, he took him in hand, and I'm, I'm reading the, uh, the message right now. Yeah. Peter took him in hand, protesting, impossible, master. That can never be. But Jesus didn't swerve. Peter, get out of my way. Satan, <laughs> get lost. You have no idea how God works. End quote. Then Jesus went to work on his disciples. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself, your true self. What kind of deal is it to get everything you want but to lose yourself? What could you ever trade your soul for? Now that's an interesting way to put it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read it in the King James uh, so that you can see it more the traditional way that people read through this section. Um, so... Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Now, I'm, I'm going to stop there because I think it's important to point out how different these two translations are. Um, in the, the message, it says, You have no idea how God works. Okay. And that sounds like he's talking to Peter, but in the King James, he's it, talking to he's the enemy talking, that's whispering to Peter. He's talking directly to Satan. Right. He says, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. And that's something that you simply do not see in the message. It's just not there. Right. It, they, they took that section out. It's almost like they they didn't want Jesus to sound like he's attacking Peter when if you understand what's going on he's not attacking Peter he's attacking the one setting Peter up for a fall right so you know and again this is where I'm going to go back to the Phillips because I think the Phillips is a little bit more of a an accurate rendition Phillips is uh, but it's still in a more modern lingo so right. um, let me read through this and that way you can see sort of the difference there uh, and then Peter took him on one side and started to remonstrate with him over this God bless you, master. Nothing like this must happen to you. Then Jesus turned round and said to Peter, out of my way, Satan. You stand right in my path, Peter, when you look at things from man's point of view and not from God's. Yeah. So it's, a, it, it, it's, it's part talking to Peter and part talking to Satan. And the King James picks that up because it says, you know, um, he turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Right, um, but at the same time, a lot of people kind of what did he mix come it up? Peter for? That, well, they, they feel like he's calling Peter Satan. Yeah, you know, and that's not true. He just said Peter is, you know, this rock. 
Uh, and now, big one. He's a chip off the old block. Right. And, and now he's coming back and saying, you know, yeah, now you're Satan. You know, yeah, so it's right. kind of, no, that's not the case. Um, he, he is talking to both. But um, if we finish this out real quickly in the, the King James, remember in the message from this point on, he says, you know, Jesus went to work on his disciples. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. Uh, and this is talking about verse 24 through 26. So we'll pick this up um, in verse 24, um, which in the, the uh, King James says, uh, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So the, the message says, uh, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Uh, and in the King James, it says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. So in this case, the message actually adds to the word. Uh, it puts extra in there that wasn't there. Now, I'm not right. saying that what they put in is necessarily wrong. It sounds like something that would be a part of a good sermon, um, but it is, is not scripture. Um, so he's putting in things like self-help is no help at all. Yeah, that's, that's not that, that's not a translation. That's not a transliteration. That doesn't come from anywhere. That is an explanation. Right. Um, so one could even say that those are notes that have been scribbled into the the lines of a person's Bible. Um, but I, I would not consider that to be scripture. Right. So there are some some big warnings, if you will, to take from tonight's session. If only be careful what you are reading. And like right. I said, don't read just one translation. Be a Marian, know read what you're more doing. Than one. Right. So um, we'll read through to the end. It says, um, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Uh, and that is to the end of verse 26 here in the King James. So that part is a little uh, more close to what was actually written, where it says, What kind of deal is it to get everything you want but to lose yourself? What could you ever trade your soul for? Um, which, by the way, is improper English, but that's okay. <clears throat> for whatever could you trade your soul? Yes, exactly. Um, so the Phillips translation uh, answers this. It says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to follow in my footsteps, he must give up all right to himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For the man who wants to save his life will lose it, but the man who loses his life for my sake will find it. For what good is it for a man to gain the whole world at the price of his own soul, what could a man offer to buy back his soul once he had lost it? Hmm. <laughs> so that's, it's, that's pretty direct, isn't it? it? It is. It's very direct. It's very clear, actually. Um, but that that is to the end of verse 26. Now let's go ahead and finish this out. And the King James, uh, the way that it finishes out is it says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Once again, this is directly going against the, the type of preaching which uses the keys to the kingdom uh, to create a philosophy of um, earthly dictatorship over right. a heavenly kingdom. Right. Uh, which is that, you know, we're supposed to be ruling and reigning together with Christ, which means the Pope gets don't, to decide who goes to heaven. Don't they call that a dominion principle or something like that where we take over? I, I'm, I'm not positive what the terminology is that they use, but I do know that the, in differing forms, many different cults have used the idea of the keys to the kingdom uh, to, uh, and it's sort of a perverted kingdom principles yeah, um, right. method of, of using that grant of authority as if it gives us the right to dictate who will and will not go into heaven and for what reason. So like, for instance, they could say, you know, that um, uh, because in the Mormon church, the um, many of the, the men had died in the war, right. that it's now, right. previously it would have been a sin to have more than one wife, but now, now protecting the community, be, you know, because we're protecting the community, we're going to come together, all of our minds have come together and decided this is no longer a sin. Uh, and it's very relative. It's very humanistic, moralistic deism. Right, uh, and so it's it's it's. And if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, feel free to look that up. But it's it's very, um, I, I am God, 
Um, and that, that and goes entirely against everything in scripture. It goes against everything in scripture, but that's the underlying root. It's the poisonous root, if you will, that, that, that backs this up. So if you're looking at it from a top-down perspective and you don't dig down to the root, it seems like it could be a legitimate thing. God granted authority. We're just using that authority. You know, we're able to decide whether something is free or not free. But the fact is that God did not grant the authority for us to change what is right and wrong. What he granted was an authority to act, and to, uh, and so, and to develop a community that can work together as a community. Right. So there's a the, there's there's no right given to us to decide that something is or is not a sin. That was never part of this bargain. Right. Uh, and so whenever you see uh, someone saying you know that they're binding or loosing on that basis, you're you're running into a very dangerous plot of territory. Okay. It's um. It's cultish. It, it's uh, heresy. And I, I want to read this if I can. This is out of the, uh, the, the context information I looked up. Just like the Pharisees and Josephus' quote, the disciples were given a right to legislate, to make rules and norms, allowing and forbidding things in their own community. That's the binding and losing of the first century. It's like made me think of some Australians I ran into. Well, we can't go to that church because they won't let us wear shorts. Right. Well, in Australia, that's a common thing to do is everybody wears shorts. Here we wear, tend to wear longer slacks. Right. And they felt like they couldn't come to an American church because most people are in business suits and they were going to come in their shorts. And I was like, no, that's just, that's your society. That's, that's not a sin thing. Now, if you want to come naked, that might be a problem. <laughs> well, yeah. Now, um, they say come as you are, but not there that, are limits. Not that much as okay. you are, thank you very much. All right, so um, w there are a few more verses to hit here before we finish that. So verse 27 and 28 uh, in the, the message, uh, it says, Don't be in such a hurry to go into business for yourself. Before you know it, the Son of Man will arrive with all the splendor of his Father, accompanied by an army of angels. You'll get everything you have coming to you. A personal, <laughs> <Good and bad. laughs> a personal gift. This isn't pie in the sky by and by. Some of you standing here are going to see it take place, see the Son of Man in kingdom glory. Okay, so that's the, the message. And then the King James says, uh, again, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with the angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. So there's a little bit of a different connotation when it yeah. says you get everything you have coming to you, a personal gift. Um, I don't see a personal gift in here at all. No. Um, and then also, you know, it's a little bit different when he says, um, you know, that uh, this isn't pie in the sky by and by. Um, it, he said, I, I get it. You know, he's kind of adding to to sort of explain this this section right. more of an amplification, really, um, which is going to be interesting because next week we're going to be using the amplified. I love the amplified when we when we look through this, but um, in any case. He goes on here to say um, that uh, some of you standing here are going to see it take place, see the Son of Man in kingdom glory. Uh, and so I'll, I will read this in the, the, um, the Phillips so you get the idea of that, which it says, <laughs> For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father and in the company of his angels, and then he will repay every man for what he has done. Believe me, there are some standing here today who will know nothing of death till they have seen the Son of Man coming as a king. Okay, so this, again, is an interesting quote. And the reason why I'm pointing this out is because he makes a very clear promise, which is that not everyone standing there would be dead by the time that he comes back as a conquering king. Now, has he come back say, as a conquering king? But does it say you will see him as a king? And yeah. think, think of how they saw him go up into glory with all the saints that had gotten out of the, they watched him go up to be a king. No, well, that, that may be true, but the intent of this is very clear. It says for the son of man. But that's in the Phillips, right? Or is that King James? The, in all three translations, you're going to see the same intent. So, um, and in fact, in any translation that's an accurate depiction of the original language, you're going to see the same intent, which is for the son of man will come, future tense, in the glory of his father and in the company of his angels, and then that time when he comes, he will repay every man for what he has done. Or in the King James, 
uh, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then, at that time, he shall reward every man according unto his works. After you've been written in the book or, of life, or and you get judged by your works. Sure, or the message where it says, uh, before you know it, the Son of Man will arrive with all the splendor of his Father, accompanied by an army of angels. You'll get everything you have coming to you, personal gift, right? So each one is, is saying the same thing, which is at that moment is the judgment. So the time we're talking about is the second coming of Christ. This is a clear depiction of the second coming of Christ. And he says, then in the very next verse, context is important. Right. In the very next verse, it says, verily I say unto you, very truly I say unto you, that there are some standing here which shall not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, with that claim, with that very important claim. Well, Christ um, hasn't returned yet. <laughs> right. So, But all of the disciples, as far as we know, are, are dead. dead. Okay, so this is one of the verses or sections of verses which are used by the Mormons specifically uh, who say that John, I believe, is still alive uh, and that he is immortal. In fact, he's the, um, the, the final apostle, if you will. John died on Patmos. Um, yeah, I, I think it's John, but there, the, one of the apostles is, is alive. And so they, they have their own apostles that basically take over, but they only have 11 of them, and he's the 12th one or something like that, and nobody knows where he is. But um, that's the... Right, that's, that's the, the, the core of that belief. So how do we, as Christians... Uh, who and this I'm gonna I might get castigated for saying this, but as rational Christians uh, come to understand this section of scripture, I mean, how how are we supposed to apply what we understand of uh, of uh, proper uh, scriptural interpretation to a section of scripture that seems to suggest that Christ is going to come back in the next thirty years when clearly he didn't? Well, the only thing I can tell you is. What you do understand is what you need to walk on. What you don't understand, you trust God to eventually reveal it. And if he hasn't revealed it to you yet, you have some other things to work on that you do know. I, I don't know. I have to take that on faith because that's a question for me too. Because I've seen that and I'm like, okay, what is it? Does it mean, what, what is it? D did they see you? as the king rising with the saints following you but that's not the army i see in revelation when you come back as a conquering king you've got a vesture dipped in blood of your enemies and right. it's after the wedding and we're all coming back with you to rule and reign and some will go a twinkling of an eye they won't taste death they'll just be from here to there when you return so I'd be confused and from that <laughs> I, I go back to isaiah says come let us reason together and honey you're not smart enough to know everything I know. You're living under the rug and see the knots. I'm above the rug and made it. Okay. So that's why I have to take those things I don't understand. I put on a shelf and ask God to reveal them to me when I am capable of handling them properly. Until then, help me do the ones I have understood properly to act them out in the way that I'm supposed to apply them. And don't let those things, though, we get to those points. For me, that's like trying to decide how many angels dance on the head of a pen. It's very important, but not right now. Okay. That'll come when it's supposed to come. All right, so I'll give you a couple of ideas that some people have applied to this scripture okay. in order to try and, and I'm going to say it this way, explain it away. Right, right, right. Um, one is that the regeneration spoken of in scripture of being born again um, mm -hmm. is what explains it which is that those who are born again don't taste death because they don't taste the second death. Right. Um, and while that's true, that is not the expression used no, here. No, it's not. The expression used here is, is shall not see um, physical death. Right. And of course we see physical death, right? Um, so a couple of the scriptures used on that front that people try to, to – you know, fit, if you will, would be John eight fifty one, where he says, truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Um, well, and when you think of the difference of people who have died that has been reported, those who are Christians go, wow, look at this. They are excited to go home. And then you have others like Nietzsche 
and some of the others that are screaming in terror, the savior, the sa and they're, they're tasting death because the enemy's after them. Right. So right. we, we so, and so I that's, could see how is that one, is. We're not going to taste it because we right, get to so, go home. That, so, we just walk through the gate. Right. So this, this is one that, um, that is very similar to that. Um, <laughs> John eight fifty two directly after that, uh, the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died as did the prophets. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Um, so it would be, will not see the death of hell. Right. Basically. Um, and or, or the death angel coming after you well i mean christ is the death angel well, as i understand yes, but it so for us that's not a fearful thing no uh but still you know for oscar wilde it was a fearful thing because he was a low life right others others apply the fact that transfiguration happened um to this to say right you know they saw christ coming in glory with the angels and as they a, did too as a king Therefore, you know, since they saw him, this was a fulfillment of the prediction. And I wondered about that since Moses and Elijah were both there and recognized him as the king. Right. But there, there are a but, lot of issues with that. Like, right. for instance, Christ says some. Christ says, some of you who are here, here and they will see it. Moses and Elijah and, weren't part of the disciple group. Well, but the, the, the fact is that, that some of those who were there didn't see the transfiguration. Right. Like, all of them did. You know, yeah. the, you know, some will not see death before this happens. Who died? Which of the ones that he was talking to died before he saw, uh, before the transfiguration occurred? The one who died, who was he talking to? He was talking to his core disciples. None of them died before the transfiguration. Bingo! That's Only a, John the Baptist. That's that's a massive hole in yeah. this theory because you know if if none of them were going to die, then he would have said that. He didn't. He said some. some. Okay, so um, so that's one. But if that wasn't even you know enough, the final thing is who got judged. Who got judged with the transfiguration? Who, no one. Who, who got judged? No one. So clearly this is not the same thing that it was being prophesied about. Right. So the transfiguration is out. So if you're going to try and use the hat, just don't. Um, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, an another thing is that um, people use, instead of looking at you know regeneration, meaning that you're not going to see death, uh, they look at the fact that you see, you know, that you have life, which is very, very similar, um, but it's going to say um, not the physical death, but the spiritual death, um, which is you don't see spiritual death um, because he's saying that um, some of those who, were, who, who he was talking to at that time were going to see spiritual death. Well, are you sure it was only the 12 or was he talking to a larger group among the 12? Well, I mean, let's let's. I'm trying to remember it. the context. I don't remember. Yeah, no. Let, let's look at it. So that's going to be in verse 24, uh, which in the King James, if we read that, says, "Then said Jesus unto his disciples." Yeah, but at one time he had 500. Right, and then in uh, in you know, let's see, in the uh, Phillips again, it says, "Then Jesus said to his disciples," and in the uh, message, it says, "Then Jesus went to work on his disciples." So. Who those disciples were, not sure, but some of them could potentially have fallen away. The only one that I know that fell away. Of the core disciples, at this point, would have been Judas. Right. Yeah. So that one actually sort, sort of lines up, right? So it sort of makes sense um, that he's saying the spiritual death, um, which is going to happen, you know, they'll not taste death, or that there's um, a spiritual death that's going to occur, but that most of them are not going to have a spiritual death. But at the same time, he's clearly talking about time frame when he, he brings right. this up. Uh, and spiritual death is not a time frame issue. We're already spiritually immortal. So um, why would he use it as something to measure time if it's spiritual death? So that doesn't seem to, to really hold water for me. And we're already spiritually dead until we come to him. We Again, died at the garden. Precisely, because we're already spiritually dead. So the only one that 
I can see working is the regeneration answer, which is to say, having been regenerated, we will not see the second death. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, in, in that um, explanation, there were some who were there, perhaps some of the 500 disciples, perhaps Judas, but those who, who would see the second death, who would fall away and would end up being uh, an example of what uh, not to do of one who did taste of death like Ananias and Sapphira before Christ came back right so uh, that one I can see working uh -huh. um, but at the same time it doesn't answer all the questions for me right. so I don't have all the answers I'm not claiming to have all the answers um, no but it's a good it's good thinking it's but it is good, it's uh, important to think through um, so hopefully we've enjoyed that we've gotten through quite a bit. Uh, we worked our way all the way through to the end of this chapter. Um, thank you guys for joining me here. You're welcome. And uh, thank you all for uh, viewing this online. If you have questions, again, you can always comment those in the uh, bottom of our Facebook feed over here um, <laughs> or in the YouTube comments down below. Exactly. Uh, and we will be happy to uh, answer that as soon as we do get it. Um, now, that could be uh, a day or two, but we'll, we'll do the best we can to get to it. Uh, and again, uh, thank you for, for uh, going through the scriptures with us. Let's go to the Lord in no, a no, brief word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you've shown us tonight. And uh, please bless us as we uh, go on our way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Go with God.